lesson in a new series that I'm making about jazz improvisation. I've already made 25 lessons in my series how to play bebop jazz piano. If you want to look at those I've put a link in the description below but they are quite advanced lessons and I've been asked to make a series for pianists who can already play the piano to a certain extent but are completely new to jazz improvisation. There is a PDF available for this lesson and there's a link in the description below and it contains all the examples from this lesson in all 12 keys. I'm going to take a step-by-step -step approach with a new concept covered in each lesson and I'm going to assume no prior knowledge other than being able to play some major scales and preferably being able to read music to a certain degree, although this is not absolutely essential. Traditionally, jazz musicians have used standard songs from what's become known as the Great American Songbook as a basis for improvisation. They often use what we call lead sheets, which look like this. The melody of the song is written together with chord symbols. Now, if the chord symbols look a bit daunting to you at the moment, don't worry, I'm going to explain them all as we go along. The accepted norm for playing a jazz standard is to first go through the song playing the melody roughly as written, but often changing the rhythm and the odd note here and there, and we call that the head. Then you play one or more improvised solos in which you abandon the melody, but you try to articulate the given chords by your choice of notes. Now, if you don't quite understand what I mean by that, again, don't worry, I will explain that further as we go along. After the solos you would normally repeat the head often with some slight modification. So in this lesson I'm going to look at ways to improvise over a very simple chord progression that you find literally all over the place in jazz standards. It's called the 2-5-1 progression and what that means is the diatonic seventh chords which are built on the second fifth and first degrees of a scale. Now, you may well not know what I mean by that. I'll do a very brief explanation here. And in the description below, I'll put a link to another video in which I explain them in full. So here we go, a very brief explanation of diatonic seventh chords. Let's take a C major scale. Now on each note or degree of that scale, you can build a seventh chord by adding the note which is three letter names above it. So E, C, D, E, that's three letter names, five letter names, C, D, E, F, G, and then seven letter names, B. You can do that on every degree of a C major scale, and you get a series of what we call diatonic seventh chords. Diatonic means that all the notes in all those chords come from the key of C major. In a major key, there are four different types of diatonic seventh chords. Major, minor, dominant, and minor seven flat five, also known as half diminished seventh chords. So for instance, in the key of C major, on the first degree and fourth degrees, you get major seventh chords, C major seven and F major seven. On the second, third and sixth degree, you get minor sevenths, D minor seven, E minor seven, A minor seven. On the fifth degree and only on the fifth degree, you get a dominant seventh, which we usually just refer to as a seventh chord. And on the seventh degree, and again, only on the seventh degree, you get a minor seven flat five chord. Now, what makes them different from each other is the distance between the notes in the chords, which we call intervals. For instance, if we look at a C major 7 chord and look at the distance between the root note, C, that's the note on which the chord is built, and the third, 
E, let's count the semitone between them. One, two, three, four. Now let's look at a minor seven chord. We'll take D minor seven and count the semitones between the root and the third and we get just one, two, three. Now, at this point, you don't really need to concern yourself too much with intervals. If you do want to know more about them, I do explain them more in the video about diatonic seventh chords, though. Jazz improvisers use a combination of motives, which are short melodic ideas, for instance, and lines using mainly eighth notes, for instance, Now, I'm going to look at the lines first, and I'm going to look at eighth note patterns that you can use, which contain chord notes only. With my left hand, I'm just going to play two notes from each chord. For D minor seven, I'm going to play the root and the seventh, that's D and C. When I go to G seven, I'm going to play the root and third, G and B. Now, Notice how the 7th of D minor 7, C, drops a step to the 3rd of G7. This gives what we call smooth voice leading. Now the 3rd of G7, B, is then repeated as the major 7th of C major 7. So for C major 7, we've just got the root C and major 7th. And then to create some kind of movement, I'm going to change the major 7 halfway through the bar to the 6th. In jazz, we usually play 8th notes in what we call swing feel. Normally, if we divide quarter note beats into 8th notes, the 8th notes are of equal length. So, for example, if I play a C major scale in 8th notes, it sounds like this. 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. So all the notes are the same length and also the accents fall on the downbeats. Now in swing feel, we play the eighth notes with a triplet feel with the first of each pair of eighth notes lasting twice as long as the second like this. One and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four. Notice also that in swing field, the accents are on the upbeats rather than on the downbeats. I mentioned earlier on that to begin with, I'm only going to use chord notes when creating an improvised line. Now, you may well have heard about various scales that jazz musicians use when improvising. And of course, I will come on to these later on in the course. But by starting off with only chord notes, First of all, we won't play any notes in the improvised line that clash with the chords. And secondly, by restricting the choice of notes to just four per chord, it means that as long as you become thoroughly familiar with the notes of each chord in different positions, then you can quite quickly start learning to improvise. Let's look now then at four different positions for a D minor seven chord. So with the left hand, I'm going to play the root and the seventh. And the right hand, I'm going to play these notes in that position. And then I'm going to take the D and put it up there. Then take the F and put it up there. And now take the A and put it up there. So four different positions. Now, you may well hear these referred to as inversions. But if I'm playing the root of the chord down at the bottom, we call that in the bass, then all of these chords are in fact in root position rather than in inversion. So I'm referring to these as positions rather than inversions. Let's look at four different positions now for the notes of the G7 chord. So with the left hand, I'm going to play the root and the third. The right hand starts off like that. Take the G up to the top and then take the B to the top. But I'm going to bring it down here so we're not going too far up. And then take the D up to there. So once again, we've got four different positions. 
you could keep going up like that but what I've done is gone got to there and then come down and then gone to there Let's make some patterns now from these different positions. To begin with, for each chord, I'm going to play every note once. So on the D minor seven for the first position, I'm simply going to play the note from the bottom up to the top. Remember that we're playing these in eighth notes with a swing feel. So one, ah, two, and ah. For the next position, I'm going to start on the top note Go down to the bottom and then back up. For the third position, I'm going to start on the D, go up to F, down to A, and then back up to C. And then for this position, I'm going to start on the D, go up, up again, and then down to the bottom. Now, you may have noticed that in each case, I finished on the C, which is the seventh of D minor seven. And I've done that deliberately because I can go from there onto the G7 chord, starting on B, which is the third. Now, just as in the left hand, when we're playing these outlines of the chords, the seventh of D minor seven, C drops a step to the third G7 which gives you smooth, what we call voice leading. The same thing applies to the improvised solo. So for instance, if I was doing the first position, I can then go on to B on the G7. And that's always a, a good smooth way of going from a D minor seven to G7, finishing D minor seven on the seven, to G7 starting on the third. You don't have to do it that way every time, but to begin with, it's a good thing to remember. Let's look at some patterns on G7 then. Remember, I'm starting all these on the third. So for that position, if I'm starting on the third, I could go. For that position, if I'm starting on the third, I could go. For the, that position, I could go. And for that one, I could go. Now, you notice that all of these, I've ended up on the seventh, which is good because it means that I can then start the C major seven on the third. So there's an important principle to remember here, and it's this that if you're playing a cycle progression, now what I mean by that is where the root of one chord goes down a fifth to the root of the next chord. So for instance, D minor seven going to G seven, the root of D minor seven D goes down a fifth to G. And then G to C, G goes down a fifth to C. So, if it's a cycle progression, the seventh of one chord always leads nicely to the third of the next chord. So the seventh of D minor seven leads nicely to the third of G seven. And the seventh of G seven leads nicely to the third of C. By the way, if the root of a chord goes up a fourth, for instance, D goes up to G, D, E, F, G, one, two, three, four, we call that down a fifth because D going down to G is down five letter name. So up a fourth and down a fifth are one and the same thing. Let's look now then at how we can combine some of these patterns on a two, five, one chord progression in the key of C major. Let's start off with this one. So on D minor seven, I use that pattern, finishing on the seventh of D minor seven, going down a step to the third of G seven, finishing on the seventh of G seven, going down a step to the third of C major seven. 
I finish the phrase on beat one on the C major seven chord like this. Just two eighth notes with an accent on the upbeat. Now, also, I didn't linger on that note. I came off it fairly abruptly. That's a typical way to end a jazz phrase. Another thing to notice is where I put the accents. Now, I've explained that in swing feel, you generally put the accents on the upbeats rather than the downbeats. But another thing that I like to do is as the line goes upwards, when it gets to the top of a curve, I tend to put an accent on that note just before it comes back down. So that's the top before it goes back down a step. I put an accent there. And then that's the top of another curve. It comes back down. So, so I put accents there. Now, if you do that, you'll find that the accents actually start falling on different places in the bar. And once again, it, that gives it a real authentic jazz feel. OK, let's have another look um, now at a different pattern, starting the D minor seven with this one. And we can do this pattern. So I used a different pattern on the D minor seven. I used this one. But then I used the same pattern on the G seven and the same ending on the C major seven as I did in the first example. So this is how you can combine these different patterns and get lots of different variations. So let's have a look now how we could use that pattern that I've just used, but then a different pattern on G7. So you see that with a little bit of imagination, you can combine these patterns in lots and lots of different ways and come up with all kinds of different phrases. Now, in the PDF, by the way, there are quite a few more examples and they are shown in all 12 keys. I wouldn't make the mistake, though, of attempting to learn them all in all 12 keys straight away. And I really want to emphasise this because a lot of people get sort of hung up with this notion that they've got to go through the whole thing straight away. What I would do is pick a few keys like C major, F major, G major, Try and master 251, get used to those different positions in those three keys, get used to these patterns in those three keys, and then gradually add a key at a time. Don't try and do the whole thing at once. Let's have a look now at some ways that you can tweak these phrases, and you'll be really surprised just how much better you can make them sound with the slightest modification. So let's start off just with this phrase. <laughs> simply miss off the first eighth note. It has a much more authentic sound to it, that. Uh, beginning improvisers often feel a little bit pressurised into playing something all the time. And you'd, you've got to have some space in your improvisation. And also, it's a good idea if you can start the phrase somewhere else apart from the downbeat of beat one. Now, another simple tweak that you can do is to displace some of the notes in the pattern by an octave. So in that phrase, I played on the G7. This time, I'm going to simply take the last two notes and bring them down an octave. So now we've got. Another great way of tweaking these phrases is to introduce a syncopated rhythm. So I'm going to go back to this one and I'm going to play the same three notes. Now this time I am actually going to start on the downbeat on beat one, but I'm going to play a syncopated rhythm and it will sound like this. Now syncopated rhythms are great in jazz. And notice that the accent comes on the long part of the syncopated rhythm. Another way is to uh, miss the first two quavers out. So instead of going, just come in on beat two. What I 
played in the introduction was a modulating exercise that I've made using combinations of these different patterns going through different keys. So I started off in C major with 2, 5, 1, D minor 7, G7 going to C major 7, changing to C major 6, and then changing that to C minor 7, which is chord 2 in the key of B flat major. So then F7 chord 5, B flat major 7, changing to B flat 6. And I then change that to B flat minor 7, which is chord 2 in A flat, going to E flat 7, which is chord 5, to A flat major 7, to A flat major 6, and so on. Now, you notice that each time we change key, we're going down a tone. So we're going from the key of C to B flat, to A flat, to G flat. Now, if we think of that as F sharp, then we go down to E and then down to D. Now, if you just carried on using the same pattern, you would then go back to C major. So at that point, what you have to do is go up a semitone and go to E flat minor, and that takes you through the other six keys. Now, in the PDF, I've got what I played in the introduction going through all 12 keys. But again, if you decided to get that, I wouldn't try and master all 12 keys in one go. Take it one step at a time. So in the next video, I'm going to be introducing passing notes. That's non-chord notes that pass in between two chord notes as a step towards playing scales. I'm going to be introducing the use of the ninth on the major seven, minor seven and dominant seven, and also the flattened ninth on the dominant seventh, and look at some more rhythms. So I hope you found it all useful. If you did, I'd be grateful if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so so far. And I'll leave you once again with what I played in the introduction. Thank you. Thank you.